this career will never work for you. It's so oversaturated. Mm. It's a race to the bottom. All these kids with their home recordings charging 50 bucks a song are ruining the industry. We're here in uh, Nashville at uh, Brian Hood's place. And we're going to talk a little bit about the business side of audio. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for coming here, man. I know it was a long walk from your hostel to here. <laughs> Not that bad. It was yeah. like 15 minutes. <laughs> no joke. You literally walked an hour to have lunch with me the other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. I like walking. Yeah, this it's... man's devoted to, to his networking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I would just jump straight into it. Uh, yeah. Talk about the good stuff. And uh, then we can talk a little bit about your background. You have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but the main reason I'm here is to talk about your courses and your podcast. Um, would you mind telling a little bit what that's about, like describing it? Yeah, sure. So the podcast is called the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, and it's the same topic as the courses, which is uh, the business of running a recording studio. So uh, a lot of us are very right brand creative. We know how to like make great audio and put out like great art, but we don't know how to run a business. And so the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast and uh, the Profitable Producer Course, which is my main like flagship course, uh, they're both created to help put those two pieces of the puzzle yeah. together so that you can have a sustainable business that is also creating great art. So you clearly like found a hole in the market for educational stuff in the audio realm, sort of. Um, how did you like get to that point where you realized that you had a talent for it? I think, um, I just think at some point I took the business part of my life seriously. And it was like, I, I talk about it on that webinar that I that mm. I do, which is I had this ra random round of golf with a guy, which I'm like that lame kind of guy that plays golf. Like I'm serious about it. I was on my high school golf team. Mm. And this guy, <laughs> this guy had a business called Chubby's Chicken out of Tallahassee, Florida. And uh, he ran this business and he'd set it up in a way where he was making like 20 grand a week off of like two or three hours of work. And so I spent like the next four hours just picking his brain on how he had done this. And that just kind of like lit that entrepreneur spark in, in me. And, uh, and so I got into a bunch of business books and all these other things. And then I realized like, okay, there's a lot of things to learn in the, the business side of running a recording studio that I hadn't thought of before. And there is a lot to this. And I just slowly over the period of a year or two started to figure those things out. And, um, and it all kind of culminated at a point where, uh, it was April 2014. I'll never forget this. I was reading a producer. You probably you probably know the guy. I'll tell you off camera who the guy is. <laughs> um, it's a, a well-respected producer who who was who was on like Ask.fm, which used to be I don't know if people use this anymore, but it used to be a site where people could ask questions anonymously, and then the person receiving them would answer the questions, mm. uh, and then you could read through the responses. And most of them were like gear nerdy questions. But one one guy was like, "Hey, I've got twenty thousand dollars to start my studio uh, with a partner of mine. Do you have any advice before we get started?" And this, this producer was like, you can't get started with 20 grand. Just run the other way or like mm. run as far away as you can. Mm. It was something, some horrible advice about just not doing anything. You don't, with 20 grand, you can't do anything with yeah. a studio. And I was just like, oh my God, that's the worst advice I've ever seen. And so I wrote a very sassy response to that. Mm. And I just put it at blog.456recordings.com, which is my studio's <laughs> website. And just kind of like, I was like, it was an excuse to talk business. And so I was just kind of putting it out there to see if people would be interested in the, the concept of like a business focused blog for recording studios. And that first article, I had like a, I didn't even have like a, the content upgrade or the lead yeah. magnet, you know, all the stuff that you're supposed to have for like a blog launch. I didn't have any of that. I was just like, if you're interested in this topic, <laughs> put your email address in here. And within the first three days, I had 2000 email subscribers. Whoa. Like it was insane. So I knew the demand was there. And that article got shared over 2000 times on Facebook. Uh, like a tons and tons of responses and likes. And like, this is back when Facebook organic reach was actually a thing you could get, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so from that point on, uh, I just knew that I had to keep going with it. And it was like a slow process, but it's it's been, you know, I guess, four and a half years in the making now. Yeah, so maybe you already answered this a little bit, but did it take a long time before you had like all the pieces of the puzzle together to to make something out of it? Like construct the full course? Yeah, so the sixfigramstudio.com, I eventually moved the blog over to that URL, probably within like a matter of weeks or just a couple months. And <laughs> I did... I had followed some advice from some very, very smart people, which was build the audience first and then worry about monetizing the audience later. Mm -hmm. And so I blogged for, I want to say three, three or four years before I ever monetized a six figure home studio in any way. Yeah. So I had built a mailing list of like 20,000 people. I had 
um, blogged for a while. I had put YouTube videos out. I tried a bunch of different things. I don't think I launched a podcast yet. I think I did the podcast after launching the course. But I'd done a lot of stuff to put in a lot of work because I knew just the basic concept of reciprocity. If you create valuable stuff that helps people, when it comes time for you to put some sort of paid content out there or mm. paid course out there or paid product out there, people will like throw their money at you mm. because they helped you so much with the free content and the paid stuff must be that much better. So that was kind of the advice that I followed. Oh. And so it took quite a while to where I was with the point. And even then, I remember when I was coming up with the concept of uh, the Profitable Producer course, which is my first course, I spent a month just sitting and outlining the ideas and mapping out videos and stuff. I probably had 2,500 words worth of an outline, like all the topics and all the things. And then I hired a business coach, which was like three grand a month, which was a huge investment at the time because I wasn't making that much money. Um, thankfully, I actually had Airbnb money at that time, which was funding the <laughs> Six Figure Home Studios business stuff. But um, I, I had hired a business coach to help me with it. And we ended up scrapping that almost that entire outline. I don't think I've used anything from that original outline. And so we did like focus groups and surveys and like really did, dug into what people's pain points were and where they were falling short and then put a much, much better course outline together. It took three more months of just planning. And then we did like that. Did you, were you part of the dream team? The, the first batch of, we had 50 people that started us out. We did a, a live eight week course. No. And, I was I was in the course last year. Oh, okay. So I think I was the third run. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So but we did a live version of the course first just to test it out and see like where the weak points were before I ever even filmed anything. So that was a it was a really, really intense process yeah, yeah. compared to we're not gonna talk about this because this is a side note, but I have a, a mixing course called From Shit to Gold, mm. which was just like from from first outline to like finish was maybe a six month process, but there wasn't it wasn't nearly as in depth. I just knew what I was going to teach on the mixing course, yeah. and then just taught it. I didn't blog about it beforehand. I did it all backwards, and it did it's done well, but not nearly as well. Did you do that one before or after the? Yeah, so um, I had started the process for that uh, at the beginning of 2014, mm. and then launched that course like September or October 2014 or something like that. I can't, or maybe it's 2015. The timelines are weird to me, but yeah. Anyways, uh, it was one of those things where like, I just knew if I was going to create something that was going to last years and years, I had to put a lot of, a lot of time into it. So it took a while for me to get there. And I'm, I'm one of those people that's really slow and methodical and like almost plan too much mm -hmm. before I like jump on stuff. But I think it pays off in the long run that way. That's probably my, my big, biggest struggle, <laughs> <laughs> like organizing stuff. I come from sort of a punk DIY background. So I remember, I don't exactly remember when I started listening to your podcast, but I know I had some like resistance to it at first because I got all cringed up by all the business talk and stuff like that. But now I kind of learned how to pick the pieces out that works for me. Do you feel like there are a lot of resistance from people like creative minds? Well, yeah, I mean, I can I can tell from your tattoos and your beard <laughs> and your nose ring that you're from the, the punk DIY scene. Uh, were you in a, were you in bands back then, like heavy metal stuff or heavy music or like? I have been in some. I do play in a hardcore band. Okay, cool. and I've been in some like crust punk bands nice. and stuff like that. Too. So I came from that same background. Surprisingly, even though I don't have any tattoos, any piercings, uh, I was in a metal band way back in the day. It was the drummer in that. So my background's in that too. Yeah. So I get I get both sides of things, especially like. I wasn't in like the punk world, which is even more like against the man, mm. like business is bad, capitalism's evil, that mm. kind of stuff. And so I get that for sure. But it, when you start running a business, you start yeah. to realize like, shit, if I want to do this for a living, like I probably should figure this out. So I, I think one of my biggest struggles is I've, I've like completely made the shift from like that punk DIY yeah. 21 year old Brian Hood to like <laughs> now I'm 32 and like I just I'm married now. You yeah. know, I've got. I've got responsibilities and people depend on me and employees, you know, like I've got a lot more stuff that I have to worry about now. So I've probably completely shifted the other way where I'm no, like super business. Uh, and so I, I might have like lost touch with some of my my roots in those days. Mm -hmm. So I think I do struggle with communicating the business aspects of running a studio in a way that isn't off putting to like the punk DIY yeah. kind of guys. So I should probably improve that. But I think I think I do work hard to make sure people understand that it's not just about gear it's not just about putting your stuff out there and yeah. hoping people come to you, that it, 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 there is a process to it. And some people get it, some people don't, some people are resistant at first and then they get it. But I think in the end of the day, people kind of feel my motives for what I'm trying to teach them and they're not that resistant after that. Yeah, and also, I mean, I kind of accepted the world we're actually living. And if I'm gonna make a living, I need to adjust to that system. But 
it doesn't mean that I can't have my value still. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's not like I'm ri- running a multi... Multi-million dollar, oh, billion exactly. dollar, yeah. It's not like I'm not, yet, I'm, I'm not taking advantage of anyone. Until just... you launch your build oil, beard oil brand <laughs> and start like going to corporate man, you wear exactly. suits and ties. No, I, I, I get it, man. You probably need some beard oil. Though. Yeah, <laughs> I, I totally get what you're saying, man. Like, I, I just feel like everyone can take like the stuff that I teach or what Chris, my mm. podcast co-host, who's a huge part of, of the Six Figure Studio podcast. Like I wouldn't do it without him. Mm. They can take what we teach on that podcast and then you can meld it to like whatever values you yeah. have because you're Swedish, you have a different, you're Swedish, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I, those countries kind of meld together. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, you're Swedish, you just have a different like, you have a different upbringing, you have different values, things you, yeah. you value. So you can take what we teach and do your own thing with it. You don't have to be like, this capitalistic pig, not that we teach nah. that anyways, but like, you know, <laughs> you can, you can make your own, your own, uh, life out of it. Yeah. And I like that with the, with your podcast, you, I, I think lately you've started to point out more that it's not like absolute truth, but more like, yeah, like you say, an advice buffet. Yeah. And like should, that's, that's Chris Graham's coin phrase, yeah, the advice buffet. You should be able like to pick out the pieces that works for you. Continuing on that topic, I think it's really beneficial for, for people like us in in this industry like freelancing audio people to start taking ourselves more seriously and not just bow, bow down to the idea that i mean i hear i hear from so many people that this is nothing you can do for a living yeah maybe as you said with the the guy we were talking about before on the q a but i know for a fact that it is possible but the people that have that idea are usually like hobbyists and they kind of bring the standards and prices down if you had any sort of idealistic idea behind starting this like you really wanted to help people or was it purely like a business decision to start the courses? I don't think it's actually mutually exclusive. I don't think it's one or the other. Yeah. I think, and I'm going to get a little political here. Sorry. <laughs> I just think that one of the good parts of capitalism mm. is that it aligns the interests of people. Mm. So if you can truly help people, like if I create a course that helped no one and I charge what I charge for the course, then people would like buy it. And yeah. then people would tell everyone, no, you should stay away from it. That's yeah. trash. And that's and that's capitalism at work. But for me, I can build a business that is profitable, but also helps an immense amount of people. Mm. And honestly, like even if you never buy anything from the Six Figure Home Studio, mm. from what we do, like the podcast itself is, I think, 90 episodes of yeah. absolutely like 100 percent free content to help your business. So like even with that, it's still helpful for people. So I think. The amount of money I make is a, in directly in proportion to the value I bring to, yeah. to the recording studio space. So I don't think it, it, there's definitely a monetary incentive. And I would be lying if I didn't say yeah. that. But I think that's <laughs> with any business. The more people you're able to help, the more people uh, that are willing to hand you their, their hard earned yeah. dollars when it comes to achieving whatever they're trying to do. So, OK, so let's talk a little bit more about Brian Hood. <laughs> Ooh, hold on, let me take a sip of my yeah. key lime LaCroix. It's an ad. Sponsored by LaCroix. <laughs> it's actually LaCroix, I yeah. think. I don't know how to it's speak fr- French. It's French? Yeah, it's French. Oh, nice. So I should probably be able to get it in Europe then? Probably. Uh, I think it might be Canadian French. I don't oh, actually right. know. Yeah. Let me see. Product of the USA. <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe right, it's not well, very French. You, I mean, you started, you said before you started playing in bands. How do you get into recording? Was it like out of necessity or? I think it's like the story that almost everybody that was in a band that recorded. It's yeah. like you start writing music and then you want to capture those ideas and recording so you can kind of review them and refine them. It gets back to that. We had an episode on the podcast where we talked about uh, feedback cycles, yeah. where the faster you can get something and then start reviewing it. Uh, for example, like digital photography, when mm-hmm. digital photo- photography came around, instead of having to wait to develop the film and then like have a, a a period of weeks before you can actually see the results of your work. Uh, now you can see instantly what you just did, and that gives you a much better feedback cycle. So you have you can learn much much more quickly. And so yeah. I wanted to be able to record the songs and instantly get feedback from my bandmates and from myself and listen and really think where are these weak parts in the songs. Mm. And so that kind of gave me the the very like foundational level of like how to record and edit and. You know, I wasn't a great guitar player, so I had to figure out how to edit all that stuff together. Mm. And then it slowly just grew to the point where like recording in like nice studios and not so nice studios gave me like a really good picture of what it was like to do home recording stuff or just record as a career in general. And that gave me like a a really good picture of what I wanted to do long term. Mm. And also I found a uh, like a little like 
journal from 12th or 11th grade mm -hmm. of like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I was like, I want to have a recording studio. Or oh, something. Really? So I was like, it's something I wanted to do since high school. So oh, nice. it was just a natural shift from the band life to the studio life whenever the band life kind of winded down. It's actually funny because I, when I was uh, still in, in school, my idea of my future was to have a recording studio where I could work like 50% and then have 50% a real job. So even back then, I didn't thought it was realistic to work full time. Well, that's that's a lot of people. I mean, I see a lot of cynicism. Like, so I run a lot of Facebook ads for the Six Figure Home Studio. And, and if you're watching this, you may have actually seen ads for me either now or in the past because I've run them pretty aggressively over the last year. And so you see all sorts of people from all walks of life. You see people who are like, you know, I did this course and it was awesome. And you see people who are like, this course will never work for you. And you see mm. people who are like, this career will never work for you. It's so oversaturated. Mm. It's a race to the bottom. All these kids with their home recordings charging 50 bucks a song are ruining the industry. Mm. And so you see like people from all different angles. And it's always the cynics that if you really dig into like their, and, and, and this is like, I'm not trying to sound mean to these people, but if you go look at their Facebook profiles, yeah. like they have a job at like some some like minimum wage job yeah. and they've really taken no steps to even give it a try. And they've just, their mindset is this will never work, so I will never try. Yeah. And I think that's the big difference between the people who are at least giving an honest effort. I rarely see people who are giving an honest effort have that sort of mindset where it will not work for me. At least you at the beginning yeah. thought you could make it work half the time yeah. and, and it eventually did, so. I think it was just up until like four years ago that I like didn't have the guts to do it full time. So I was having either side jobs or the last year that I I was studying at the same time for like web web production. <laughs> <laughs> but then I just had like a sort of a breakdown because I couldn't do I couldn't focus on that. I couldn't focus on the recording. I felt like I was doing both things less than like what do you say? Not as good as I Yeah. Wanted to. That's hard to juggle multiple businesses. Yeah, yeah. So what's actually my girlfriend just, just said, told me to, <laughs> to like, come on, you can do this. So I just quit everything else and tried, and now it works. Yeah. Maybe we already touched on this, but did you start a podcast or the courses first? I started the courses. We did the first beta group of fifty people, and like started around August 2017, and then we launched the podcast about a year later. All right. So the course had been out. The full launch of Profitable Producer course, like my main main baby course, like the thing that I'm proud of, that came out the full course around, I want to say January, like the filming and editing, yeah. the actual recorded videos and worksheets and all that stuff. And then the podcast launched uh, around November. We launched three episodes yeah. and we've been doing it weekly since then. About the courses, do you usually um, do, you do some updates to it sometimes? Yeah, so I, I've done updates in the past. Really, like the content itself is evergreen. The only thing mm -hmm. we have to update from time to time is like, if the interface changes inside yeah. like Wix, where we tar talk about putting uh, retargeting pixels, yeah, if yeah. something drastically changes in Facebook where something's not where it used to be, uh, we'll have to update that sort of stuff. But overall, the concepts about like the core fundamentals of business, the stuff that you build your business on top of, like the foundational aspects, yeah. those are pretty much evergreen. So we don't have to update those unless we find some sort of better way to do something. No, I think it was mostly like the, yeah, as you said, Facebook and Google stuff mm -hmm. I was thinking about, which are pretty good things, so check it out. <laughs> So what are your plans for the future when it comes to educating people? Do you have uh, other things going on? I know, I know you have some other businesses going on. I don't know yet. I don't, I'm not the kind of person that likes to just endlessly launch courses just because like it makes financial sense. Yeah. If I don't see like a big gap in the market, like the only other course that I really have that I put time into was the home studio startup. Yeah. And that was like how to make your first 10 grand in audio, which is like for very beginners. And the only reason I made that is because super beginner people were joining the profitable producer course. Yeah at a higher price point and they weren't getting as much value because they were trying to jump ahead in their careers, basically trying to sprint before they can yeah, even crawl. Yeah, I noticed that when I were a part of the course, mm -hmm. there was a lot of people that like had nothing. So they, I mean, they took your uh, From Shit to Gold course yeah. and, and that, that was the only thing they had on there. With that, like that's why all the, the guys who joined PPC, like I gave them home studio startup for mm -hmm. free because I knew that would be better for them. Um, but that's, that's the only other gap I've really found in what we teach. Chris and I have talked about on today, wait, today's Monday, tomorrow's episode that comes out, maybe doing some sort of like mastermind retreats for the Six Figure Home Studio where we just get 10 dudes, yeah. go out, rent a cabin in like some big national park like Jackson Hole or yeah. Chattanooga or the Rocky Mountains or Yellowstone or something and just spend like a three day, four day weekend together. Hmm. Just like work and play, work and play, hike and chat, like yeah. working through business problems. I think that'd be a fun way to do it where it's a more intimate group. Absolutely. We've, we've talked about doing um, some sort of more 
one-on-one coaching. Chris, Chris Graham does one-on-one yeah. coaching. I don't really do it, at least not right now. It's not something I'm that interested in doing because I like to do stuff where I can affect many people versus just one-on-one. Mm. -on -one. But I thought about, we thought about doing some sort of group coaching thing where we're able to more customize the needs of people because people that go into the Profitable Producer course, maybe like you, where you're already part-time, you already have a nice facility, yeah. you already have a lot of pieces into place. So your set of problems are so much different than someone who is already full-time. They're making 60 grand a year. They're trying mm. to go to hundred grand. That's a different set of problems and needs mm. versus someone who's just getting started. And they're yeah. like trying to get their first few clients. Like those are just different sets of needs. So finding something more customizable. But as far as courses, I don't know how you have anything else on the in the in the books. Yeah, I know you have the um, the new file sharing system, mm -hmm. FilePass. You want to tell us a little bit yeah. about it? Yeah, the unofficial tagline we have for FilePass right now is file sharing for recording studios. The thought being, you have Dropbox. Mo I'd say most studios that I know use Dropbox yeah, or too. Google Drive, but most use Dropbox. And the problem with that is they there's a few problems. One is Every single time you send a file to somebody, it tries to get them to sign up for an account and download an app, especially on mobile. It's very invasive. Mm. Uh, it usually encodes a WAV file down to like an MP3. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little quality loss there. Uh, and there's no really good way to collaborate. You have to do a lot of emails back and forth. So FilePass is, is set up to where inside of a project, which is a specific project for a specific band, you can put files in there. You can send them to clients and they can stream the WAV files. We don't encode. Whatever you upload is what mm. they send. And then they can leave timestamp revisions directly on the song, similar to SoundCloud. Yeah. And that'll let you to that allows you to collaborate with people a lot more easily without having to send But on SoundCloud emails. you have also the receiver of the file has to have a pro account. Yeah. So on FilePass, there's no accounts for your clients. Like you have an account, obviously, because you have to upload your files and log in and log out. Uh, but you send a file to somebody, it just opens straight in their phone browser or their desktop browser and streams uh, WAV files. And they can leave comments without having to sign up for an account or download any app. So that was like the big thing. I didn't want any sort of friction yeah. involved because I hate that myself. And I send something to clients and they complain that they can't figure out how to open the link in Dropbox because it's trying to get them to download. Mm. You know, it's just one of those it's like a minor annoyance that is a major problem in my business. And so I, we, we created something to solve that. And then the other big thing is you can put a paywall between you mm -hmm. and the person. So if they still owe you money, uh, you can put it up. You can either disable downloads to where they just can't download at all, or you can set it up to where they can actually pay through, through file pass. We use yeah. Stripe. Um, we don't take any cut of that. Stripe just takes their normal 2.9%, uh, which by the way, don't get me into that. Like people, so many people try to bypass the, the credit card processing fees. Yeah. Like there's not a good way to do it. I've tried. There are no, workarounds. Especially not when working with, for me, when I work with people from other countries. Yeah. The, it's going to be there regardless. Yeah. I mean, if it's a bank transfer, it's a fee. Yeah. If it's PayPal, it's a fee. So there's, we just try to make it as simple as possible. It's so like, for me, I don't try to alienate my customers by trying to get them to jump through hoops just to save me 3%. So I will send them a link to file pass. They can stream, they can leave revisions, but when they're happy, they can pay and then it in instantly unlocks downloads. So that's like a good system for, for my workflow and a lot of other people's workflow. So. Cool. So filepass.com. Yeah, so I think we can kind of wrap it up with that. So I know I've been talking to some people in Sweden uh, and told them about your podcast and a lot of them don't know about what you do. So where can they find you? You can go to, how about this? I'll do a special URL for you. I'll do the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash Ulf, or should I do Wolf? No, I just do ULF. That's okay. it. ULF. <laughs> Sixfigurehomestudio.com slash ULF. That's the URL. I'll put some of the stuff we talked about here, kind of like a little show notes page or something. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, so that's it for this week. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please consider subscribing if you haven't subscribed already. Uh, please share the video with friends. Uh, I would really appreciate if uh, more people came to watch my videos and uh, so it can grow a little bit more. And also feel free to visit my homepage, uh, hoborek.com, where you can listen to some of my previous work. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, see you next week. Bye-bye. Cheers.